and welcome to today's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm John, The Dental Guy. And I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And welcome to this special episode, a little different than what we've released, Wes, in the last couple of months, because this episode is one where the content was created previous at the Academy of Austin Integration meeting, but we're here to bring it to you with a little bit, kind of some commentary, some context, a little bit about what you're going to hear, and then a little bit of follow-up at the end to how it's affecting our practices. But before we get to that, I just want to give a shout-out to our sponsor, the Dental Crafters Network. As you guys know, if you've listened to the show for a while, you know we're big fans of the Dental Crafters Network for lots of reasons. Unlock the potential of one relationship with the Dental Crafters Network where possibilities are truly infinite. As a family-owned, full-service dental laboratory, they collaborate closely with dentists to understand and meet their unique needs in today's ever-changing dental industry. Choose Dental Crafters Network where your vision meets innovation. Visit dentalcrafters.net. That's dentalcrafters.net or call 1-800-472-8302. And don't forget to mention the dental guys to receive 10% off your first case, which is pretty nice. Pretty nice. Thanks to Dental Crafters for being a longtime sponsor of the Dental Guys. Wes, what are we going to be talking about? What are we going to be hearing about with today's episode? Well, I'm super excited about today's episode. Joe Kahn is coming on the show to talk about the evidence, the modern evidence surrounding Socket Shield. Are we hmm. ready for prime time? Is it ready to bring Socket Shield into the private practice. John and I have been really adopters of the dual zone technique that Steve Chu and Dennis Tarnow have documented over the year, years where we graft not only the bone zone, but the soft tissue zone around our dental implants. So we're going to be bringing you guys a very high level interview. Now, the questions that I have surrounding this are answered in this. And in a great way, I think in some ways, we are rewriting the Frank Spear article, Ponics versus Implants, and should we be actually using Socket Shield to enhance papilla in the anterior and the posterior where we can reduce food impaction and actually create better emergence profiles for our dental implants and these subcritical and critical contours. Yeah, fancy stuff we're talking about here this, this episode. When John and I come back after this episode is over, um, we're going to talk about really, is this even possible? Right. Because what is possible in the real world with all these different techniques? Well, there's because an article, John, that I sent you yep. that just came out yep. this past month from, it was published uh, recently in uh, the Journal of Prosthodontic Dentistry. Actually, no, wait a minute, John. It was published... It's IJPRD. It's I, right. yeah. yeah, IPJRD, International Journal of Prost uh, yeah, Prost uh, Periodontics yeah, and Restorative Dentistry. I mean, how right, do you even yeah. remember all these acronyms? <laughs> it's a fantastic article from Dr. Gluckman on, really, socket shield complications, the management of the internal socket shield exposure, mm. a multi-center case series. Now, here's what we're going to talk about that article in Geek's Corner right after this interview. Hey, listen, if you're not texting us, right, you can actually text the dental guys, 865-544-8954. Text the dental guys. I ran into a special dental guy that um, at a recent course that I took, uh, Chris Stryker, you know, shout out to Chris Stryker um, and who I ran into. We took a course together recently. He is taking it to the next level. And I appreciate Jeremy and Chris tuning into the Dental Guys tonight. So shout out to those guys, long term listeners of the Dental Guys podcast. So without further ado, here's Joe Kahn, Socket Shield. Welcome back to this special episode of the Dental Guys live from the AO meeting 2024 in Charlotte. I'm John the Dental Guy. And I'm Wes the Dental Guy. Man, what a great meeting as always. 
We have seen everything now from you know brand new products being developed and being debuted, new textbooks coming out. We've gotten to interview some great authors of new textbooks, new clinical techniques, and also I think we've talked a little bit about the gray areas, right? As we mm. spoke about mm. yesterday, the gray, the things we don't know, and the things that are you know how much can, how much do we have knowledge on? How much is expert opinion? We've explored a lot of great topics, and, and we're going to continue bringing that to you today. Over the years, uh, John and I have been a proponent of immediate extraction, immediate placement dental implants. And this field has really blossomed into, like, if you're not at least considering immediates in your practice, you've really missed an opportunity really to benefit in many ways to help our patients um, get teeth back. I mean, that's what they're, they're there for. And I think the modalities um, are starting to get more refined as we see more data come out. Somebody that John and I have followed for a very long time, uh, back in some of the original lectures that we were in, um, has influenced us in a big way. And you might have heard us talk about Dr. Joseph Kahn. And even down to his presentation style, we love going to hear Joe Kahn talk about um, his connective tissue grafting techniques and how he uses little pieces of sashimi <laughs> from the palate to be able to enhance patient's soft tissue to get the papilla just in the right place. And I really appreciate uh, Dr. Joseph Kahn being on the show with us to talk about high-level things when it comes to immediate extraction, immediate placement, and how we set our patients up for success. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, we're excited to talk with you because it's, uh, this, as Wes said, there's some of these techniques, and I think connect connective tissue grafting, which has been around for a long time, has been one of the first stops that we had in this development of the idea of how to preserve facial tissues, facial contours. And obviously you've spoken about that for many, many years. And as we've now seen other approaches come into this discussion, uh, some of which have now more years of data, some of which have fewer years of data. <clears throat> and you've published recently comparing some of those different approaches. So we may wanna have a conversation today on you know, where are we today? with connective tissue grafting, socket shield technique, dual zone. These are all different ideas of how to manage some of the same problems. So where does connective tissue grafting fall today? Is this still our go-to approach or what should we be thinking about? Well, um, great question. When you compare tissue graft, root shield, and also dual zone, I mean, I think it, each one of these has its own merits. And uh, I don't think that there's one solution that solves it all. So for me, right now, uh, for personal advancement purpose and also research purpose, I actually do all three, mm, okay? Mm. And I have some research on all three. So, uh, you know, talk about tissue graft. I mean, wh wh what's the reason for doing all this dual zone, talk to shield and all this uh, grafting? Um, the key thing is, you know, on an extraction socket, when we place an implant in there, the challenges is on an open healing socket, the socket is healing. And because of that, the ridge is going to collapse. As you know, once you extract the tooth, the bundle bone is going to be gone. And the buckle plate, depending often to the thickness of the buckle plate, I mean, obviously if it's, it's thin, some of them will collapse more. So the ultimate goal for immediate implant placement from the aesthetic standpoint is to maintain that facial gingival contour. Now, as we know now, when we look at the facial gingival contour, we can basically divide into two zones. I call it two zones, okay? So let's start with the first song. That's from the free gingival margin, go apically to the facial bony uh, wall. Providing if the patient has no periodontal disease, everything perfect, we know that the distance from free gingival margin to the facial bony crest is roughly three millimeters. Okay? Now that area has no bone. Therefore, we call it the soft tissue song. We go a little bit more apical from the bony crest all the way to the tip of the root or maybe even more because that's the bone, we like to call it the bone zone, okay? So that's a soft tissue zone, zone too. So the reason I brought this two zone up is because the ultimate goal for us as a clinician when we do immediacy is to preserve bone zone because any one of the zones lacking is not going to work. So now, go back a, back to a little bit. Uh, you don't know that nobody is going to dispute when we do immediate implant placement, we're going to put bone graft into the socket. That, that part is whatever. Now. To preserve the bone song, okay, there's two concepts to preserve it, even in 2024 today, all right? Besides grafting the, the gap, 
we sometimes graft outside the gap. Mm. In dentistry, you know, we call it contour grafting. Mm. Contour grafting, the first term was actually advocated by Danny Buser. Okay, he called that when we do contour grafting, there are two sorts of contour grafting, contour bone and contour soft tissue graft, contact tissue graft. So there's two ways to, so to preserve the bone is gap, graft gap, contour soft or hard tissue graft. Soft tissue zones, there are three ways, well, well I actually, sorry, there's one more way to maintain the, the, the bony socket is to do root shield. Because if you leave the fragment of root as Hersler and, and Otto Schuh published, you can kind of fool nature as if the two have been extracted. Mm -hmm. So we preserve the bony zone. Mm. In terms of the soft tissue zone, there are essentially two methods to treat it. Of course, the first one is to do what you call scarf connective tissue graft. All right, that means you don't, you don't do a contour. Contour, you extend it from the free to margin to the, almost to the middle part of the bone zone. Mm -hmm. Scarf connective tissue graft, just put it right at the soft tissue zone, like a scarf around the neck. The other one is like what Dennis Tanau, Steve Chu advocate, is a dual zone. So those are the three methods. Now, what is, you know, I mean, what is the best? Is there such a best? All three of them works. But I know now, okay, if you talk about the soft tissue zone, we are in the midst of doing a study. If I don't put anything in there versus I put soft tissue graft versus dual zone, the one that collapsed the most, have the most recession, is you don't put anything in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So at least in my humble opinion, in 2024, when I do immediacy, soft tissue zone, I will definitely could put something in there. Either the scarf connective tissue graph or dual zone. Now, which one is better? I don't want to do all the talking, but it's okay, right? Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. So, so I measure the soft tissue thickness. Which one is best? Okay, No graft, uh, dual zone, and, connective, and scarf connective tissue graph. We found out that no graft is the one that the mucosal, the, we don't call it the gingival around implant, we call it the implant mucosal. Mm -hmm. Mucosal thickness tends to be the thinnest. Mm. But then when we go to using soft tissue graft, uh, the scarf tissue graft, it gives us the thickest you know, uh, of the implant mucosa. Then comes the dual zone. So in terms of thickness wise, on an average, no graft is around 1.2, 1.1. Uh, with connective tissue graft, it's on the range around 2.4, mm. okay? And then with dual zone, it's approximately 1.8. That's the data right now with approximately 12 to 13 sample size each. Mm. All right. Could mm. we enhance dual zone or even connective tissue uh, grafting techniques in the soft tissue zone using custom tissue formers, either customized chair sides, patient specific, to prevent facial bone or, or facial this, soft tissue collapse. Is this all with provisionalization is this with, in it, the study that you're, that you're citing? Great point. They're all with provisionalization. Okay. okay. So therefore, therefore, now, I mean, when you talk about I think tissue formers, you talk about more like uh, either provisionalization mm -hmm. or customized abutment mm -hmm. and healing abutments like that. Okay. So the current thinking process is uh, when we ever talk about tissue formers or provisionals, we talk about emergence profile. That's mm -hmm. right. And uh, anything, well, as you know, the emergence profile can, the area from the implant platform all the way to the gingival margin, that subgingival contour, in general, can be separated into two zones, mm -hmm. okay? The critical and subcritical, as you know. So mm -hmm. let's make sure the audience understand. The subcritical zone is approximately from the implant platform, so be subgingivally, or sub implant mucosally all the way to roughly one more meters right below the free ginger margin. Critical zone is from right about one more meter below the free ginger margin to approximately one more meter coronal to it, all right? So, so what is the current thinking process is the subcritical zone, the ideal is, you know, emergence-wise, we want it to be straight coming out mm -hmm. because that's called the emergence profile. It can be straight, it can be flat, it can be concave or convex, right? So we all know convex may potentially increase the risk of perimplantitis. Mm -hmm. So now because of that, we want it to come straight out. And then we know that the critical zone, we utilize it to seal, mm -hmm. like a prosthetic seal, sealing the, the elements underneath like bone graft, soft tissue graft, so, they, you know, so, so we don't need to put a membrane and things like that. So now when you talk about tissue form, how should we shape it nowadays, actually, we want to under contour it, almost create a concavity, straight up concavity to allow room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Blood supply. For the, for, and blood supply for the placement of that tissue graft. And yes. also the own graft, because if you put it too big, you cannot put anything in there. Mm -hmm. So a combination of that will help to thicken up the tissue. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. All right. Now, what happens if you don't put anything in there and you under contour the, those tissue formers or provisionals at the subcritical zone? That means you will eventually leave a gap between the gingival margin, the facial gene mucosal, to the prosthetic components. So what happened then? Well, two things. One is it will increase the risk of it collapsing. But on the, on the other hand, because you leave a space between the implant mucosal and the pro provisionals, blood clots sometimes form, and we also have certain degree of what you call mucosal proliferation or gingival proliferation. Mm. Therefore, the key point is this. When we look at the literature, the average facial gingival mucosal thickness is probably around one more meters. Okay? And so if you don't put anything in there, what we get, we still gain something on the lit on our data is around 1.2. Mm. Okay, so we gain around 0.2. And then when you put tissue graph in there, that's when you gain the most, at least on a one year basis. We don't yeah. know long term. Okay, yeah. one mm -hmm. year at least thinking that. Mm. That's the thinking process on the on the tissue okay. formers. So if you talk about the three techniques, and we've you've outlined some of the results, the results that we're seeing, and I think then we have to start. Maybe the next thing is thinking about potential complications. Uh, technique sensitivity, uh, training required, and uh, I want to you to speak to that a little bit because all of those techniques have, again, they could be used in conjunction with one another, obviously doesn't have to be alone, but we know some of the complications, for instance, resulted with root shield, with socket shield. There, there have been some that have been reported and not always easy to manage, uh, and obviously technique sensitivity is there. Uh, how do you feel about that? You know, is this a technique that's ready for prime time? Because we've discussed that a lot, obviously, in the right hands with the right instruments. And then maybe the same with connective tissue grafting in some hands. It, it seems to us, and we're just observers, but it seems that dual zone wins in that way because it has ease of being taught. How do you feel about that? Okay. What I'll do is this. So there are multi-layers on your question. Yeah. I'm going to walk you through, if you allow me, step by step, what I look for. So first of all, let's look at the heart tissue zone. Like I say, grafting the gap is not no dispute. Now, so one way to preserve it is to do root shield. So let's talk about root shield first, okay? Root shield first published based on the literature 2010. Hersler, Otto Shield et al., okay? And uh, so because of that, we have generally 14 years of experience. In my practice, my first shield was 2010. So likewise, I have roughly almost 14 years of experience. And so, in fact, we had a multi, you know, I mean, a, a publication could be coming out, uh, a randomized controlled clinical trial comparing, you know, how the, 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 what, what we do is we look at what you call three-dimensional volumetric analysis, mm -hmm. okay? How mm -hmm. much the facial tissue contour co collapse compared to no root shield versus root shield, all right? So, so with just 14 years of experience of root shield, is that complications? Absolutely. So I will tell you roughly percentage of complication, first of all, is I would say at least under my hands, okay? Now, you cannot, some people, if you're not less experienced, maybe you have more complications, but under my hands, but of course I start from knowing nothing too, 14 years. I would say complications probably around 5%, mm -hmm. okay? Not high, but if I look compared to my first three years, Mm. The complication is much higher. It's probably around 12%, 13%, mm. because mm. I don't know what's going on. So in general, what is the rule then? First of all, the guidelines to do a root shield is this. I mean, it is very extremely technical sensitive compared to three groups you talk about. Okay? It takes a lot more work. And, uh, uh, and also, because why? Because sometimes the, the goal is that um, you want to thin out the shell. Right now, we know around 1.5 more meters. Okay? Not thicker than that. Probably, I like to take it between 1 to 1.5. Too thin, too weak. Too thick, it creates a problem that it compromises the space between the shield and the prosthetics and create what you call perforations, okay, mm -hmm. or exposures. And that's which is one of the, probably the biggest complications. Mm -hmm. So in general, what we learn about the shield is this, put it in a nutshell. One, 1 to 1.5 more meter thick. In general, we want to make it almost like a C shape that bound from pro the proximal line angle to the proximal line angle. Now, the interesting thing is this, regardless, single or multiple implants. Because we did a study comparing, people say, oh, if you do a proximal shield, extend all the way around, maybe you can help to preserve properly better. Mm -hmm. We noticed that it's almost as effective if you just take it to the line angle already, mm. okay? So the length of the shield, at least six more meters or more, because if not, you increase the width, what, what, the, the mobility or, or displacement of the shield. Mm -hmm. Number three, the shield, I mean, to select the shield, you got to have no mo mobility, all right? I mean, no periodontal disease, disease-free, and uh, uh, in general, that's a shield. Now, complications, let me walk you through. Exposure is probably the biggest problem, 
Okay, why? Because we did not leave enough space between the shield and the prosthetic components. So how much space you need, in my humble opinion, at least 1.5 millimeters. Why? Because if it's too little, you cannot allow soft tissue to develop over between it. Mm -hmm. And so how do you get that space? You either thin out the shell, or you put a baffle at the crest region of the shell, right? Or you under contour professionals or the tissue farmers, all right? That's how the number one problem is exposure. Then what other problems do they have? Well, infection, all right? In my career, I have distinctly remember around three or four infection, and they all turn out pretty bad. Mm -hmm. Either I need to remove the shield, you know, or and then I have soft tissue problem and it become a big problem. So uh, uh, infection, the key to minimize it is to selective that have no infection to begin with. Mm -hmm. Okay, no root canal problems or no periodontal problems. Okay, so so case selection again is very important. Now a uh, couple other things. Well, one other thing is interestingly enough, we have a case and you may have read it. I, I, we actually published it. Okay, uh, uh, the, la the first author's last name is Fang F A N G. Um, he did a root shield procedure, and but the thing is, he did not remove the nerve completely. Mm. Mm. So now we know very important to make sure. Mm. The first step is to go and almost like doing root canal first, first yes. step, mm -hmm. all the way to apex, and you need to do the section all the way. The, the first part to section the root is follow the root canal. Mm -hmm. Because what happens in Fang's article that was published in IJPRD several years ago is they found that after root shield procedure, because he failed to remove the nerve, the patient constantly complained of sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And that it drives the patient crazy. That's crazy. So 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 it's very important to you know, so that that part. So but that is the root shield situation, okay? Our successor is actually very good and and obviously if you leave the shield, study has shown that it really maintained the facial cost. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's ready for prime time and I think there is some merit to some of the things that you're be you're publishing that allows us to maybe rewrite uh, Frank Spears article Ponics versus implants. We're enhancing papilla even between implants. Right, which with that is, technique. With this technique. Talk to a little bit about that because that's a game changer. We've, we've always have this idea when we put, take teeth out, we put implants in. Well, that's the most ideal situation when I've got teeth on either side, mesial distal, of an implant. I can generate a certain number of ponics. Or ponics. Or yeah. ponics. That's right. right. But now so, with two implants adjacent, you've, yeah. you've shown that the socket shield actually enhances that inner implant papilla. Yeah. Of course, when I was a graduate student, I mean, Frank was a, one of the most amazing speaker, I believe, and he's a dear friend. And when I was a graduate student, I listened to him about the pontic too, and I mm -hmm. followed those rules. Mm -hmm. And absolutely, but then you're right, into implant situation, the whole game changes. And if there's one thing that's indicated for root shield, okay, in my humble opinion, is to extend the shield a little bit to the proximal to do inter implant situation, mm. okay? So why is it worth it? Now, why is it worth it? Because, first of all, let's look at data. We did uh, comparing. When we put a root shield, that means the papillae height. How much you lose the papillae between two implants when you put a piece of root shield versus, let's say, no root shield. Now, no root shield, there are, met three, there are in general three methods to deal with implant papillae that people use over years to try to preserve it between two implants. One is, well, you extract the teeth and you put two implants in and then you put a provision there hoping to hold, you know, mm -hmm. hoping to hold that. That's one method. Another method you may have heard of is some people say, oh, if the patient has two teeth that's failing, that adjacently, then you first extract only one of the two. Yes. You put an implant in and put a provision and preserve it. And then after the integration of the first implant, usually it take around two to three months, then you remove the second one and do go through the same thing. So by doing that, maybe they cut one after the other technique to maybe to preserve the papillary better, right? So the third way is, you know, so traditionally they extract the teeth and uh, let the, everything heal and put the implant in, not immediately. So when we look at our data comparing root shield versus the other three techniques, significantly difference in papillary loss. Mm. So let me give you a data. In general, again, in the implant situation, root, root shield, the mean papillary loss after one year is around 0 0.35 millimeters, roughly that, mm. less than half a millimeter. But the other group, three groups, all cluster together. All of them lost papillary over three millimeters. Mm. Mm. That's now, significant. And then, you know what's significant is, remember we talk about one after the other? And, mm -hmm. and really, that article, I mean, I'm actually the first person who published it. But you know, publication is so humbling because I kind of advocated that, but when we track those group of patients that it seems to hold the public better one after the other, over time the public shrink back to because 
mm. it's just delaying the inevitable. You understand? Yes. Because the bone, yeah, there's the no biology support. Wins, exactly. Right. Oh, exactly. So in a sense, root shield, you're right. The game changer, in my opinion, is really in the implant. But now, facially, as we'll probably later talk about, I mean, using tissue graft, contour tissue graft, contour bone graft, do so. Frequently, you know, you can, we get excellent results. It may not be 100%, but it can be 90 Six percent patients cannot tell. None of my patients can tell. Mm. So, so you're right. Game changer, definitely. In root shield. Last but not least is I think after 14 years, we can consider root shield as probably a pretty decent treatment option if the pay, if the clinician select the case properly. Mm. Okay. Now let's talk about training mm. for that because <laughs> you know again in the technique sensitivity of it, and you've mentioned your first three years. Uh, when you didn't know what you were doing with it, or you, you know, and I'm sure you had training from the best, I would guess. You went to their, maybe went to their office, or they mm -hmm. came to you, and sure, this is sure, what sure. we do, and these are the instruments we use. If if someone wants to to learn to do root shield technique, where do they go? Because we we've, we've always wondered: is this something that you just have to know somebody and you have to watch them? Are there places people can learn this? Are residency programs, for instance, teaching that technique? Well, I mean, good question. I mean. Most residents pro pro program is very traditional, mm. all right? I mean, you know, well, they, we don't want to push residents to be too adventurous. So because of that, sometimes those techniques, uh, you know, are being ignored. And also a lot of times when you have, let's say, older clinicians, I mean, they themselves, they, despite a faculty, they may not never done that procedure, but yes. it's easy to criticize, but we, we haven't done it before. So where can we get those training? I mean, at this stage, I would say, yeah, maybe certain universities, um, they are a little bit more open-minded and, 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 and that's not good or bad. It's just different people have different yes. point of views. Then um, and maybe if they are blessed to have a couple of faculties or one that really have, have some experience, okay, that's one way to guide them. The other was, I would say most effective right now is to take courses from the known clinicians. Okay, and there are many, plenty of them out there. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, in fact, the funny thing is this: I'm not trying to, I'm not here to promote, but you know, since we're at the AO, you know, uh, AO is going to have a, actually had me do a program, a two-day course in July, I think on the, the last weekend of July. I mean, Saturday and Sunday, and uh, that's going to be uh, the hands-on is going to be focusing on, on model root shield situation immediacy. That's perfect. Exercise. So that's, that's what we need to know is, you know, where people can go for this. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about maybe combining the techniques. You said that you may use all three, but there are obviously ways to combine these. You yes. know, and we've seen this in lots of different ways, whether it's combining connective tissue grafting with dual zone, even things like combining, you know, for instance, Barry Levin with the dermal apron technique, mm -hmm. you know, using a cellular dermal matrix mm -hmm. in combination. You know, do you see combinations of these techniques showing increased res or better results, or, or is it something that is just, it's, it's something we don't need to do all of it? Okay, excellent point. So remember, we go back to the hot tissue zone, soft tissue zone. Root shield, if you leave a root piece of root shield there, basically you, in a sense, you solve the problem of the hot tissue zone at all. It's not going to change. Because of that, if I do root shield, I almost never go and do a contour bone graft or contour tissue graft. Do you understand? Yes. However, the soft tissue zone is the issue. That's where the combination comes from. So I frequently, when I do root shield, okay, I will put something at the soft tissue zone. It's either dual zone technique or the scarf connected tissue graft technique. So that, that, that combination is very important. Now, um, you know, the, so if you ask me, I want to spend a minute talk about the soft tissue graft, okay? We talk about root shield, what type of complications. Soft tissue graft, it becomes, is a little bit less technique sensitive in terms of getting the graft and placing it than root shield, okay? So root shield is the most technically sensitive. Then comes tissue graft. And tissue graft is a lot less technique sensitive, okay? And then do something is probably down here. Mm -hmm. Got it? Mm -hmm. So now with the soft tissue graft, uh, uh, basically what are the, 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 the issues? People sometimes harvest it from the tuberosity or the lateral palate. And as you know, harvest from tuberosity, everybody tends to favor that because of the greater degree of fibrotic tissue, laminar mm -hmm. dula, mm -hmm. so so. However, it also has drawback. What's the drawback? Well, I'm sure you all harvest tissue graft, you know, from the tuberosity or the lateral palate. What the biggest issue is a lot of times when people harvest tissue from the palate, I mean uh, the tuberosity, you will end up usually getting a smaller graft than you want sometimes, right? But then more importantly is, and, and uh, it's like the flexibility. If you want to graft, put a piece of graft, kind of like you want to need to bend it around, 
when it's a lot of fibrotic tissue, it's hard to bend it mm -hmm. around. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, because of that, I like to go to a lateral palate, and which is more flexible. I can move it, mold it around the tissues and things like that. Now, tissue graft also has its drawback. Regardless, you do contour or scalp tissue graft. Why? Because sometimes, okay, especially if you don't seal the area between the gingival and the provisionals enough, if some of the tissue graft got exposed, mm -hmm. you will bound to have some degree of necrosis. Mm. All right? Now, necrosis will occur even if you do like as a cellular thermal matrix and so forth. Now, um, but because the, the beauty of this is, if you have necrosis, our study show that we have approximately 9% of cases have necrosis, all right? So that, that means you see, oh, tissue starts sticking out, necroding, and then you, know, you start panicking, okay? Fortunately, most of the cases, despite when you're autologous tissue graft, despite it's exposed and necrosis, it will heal, and everything most of the time is okay, all right? So now, if I use non-autologous tissue graft, such as a serial dermal matrix, if, and I've done that and I get exposures, the reaction is a lot more violent. Information is mm. there. Sometimes I get some tissue retraction. Okay, so therefore I prefer autologous tissue graft. And then, so what can we do? The goal is what can we do to minimize that tissue graft from exposing out? Well, sometimes if you feel the contour of the prosthesis cannot seal it well enough, then we'll do some cross link sutures right at the entrance of the free gingival margin just to bound it down to prevent that from happening. Mm. But necrosis is probably, I say, maybe the second most common problem with tissue graft. You know, this is all really great, but, but the really this hinges on us getting primary stability to provide us with the ability to be able to provide the patient with a provisional custom tissue former. What mm. happens when we're doing an immediate extraction, immediate placement? and we don't get primary stability. Maybe we get some, but maybe the comfort level for moving forward with you know, a second stage or a provisional isn't there in the clinician, or they don't feel comfortable moving forward. How are we treating those situations? Perfect, perfect. So, so first of all, let's talk about when, when you do immediacy, what is stable, what is unstable, mm -hmm. all right? So the guideline is not that clear because you know, a lot of companies, they cannot really tell you, okay, what will be the ideal? People usually use insertion talk mm -hmm. as the guideline, right? I mean, sometimes people talk about using the, the those renaissance frequency machines, mm -hmm. but the thing is, I mean, I'm not rich enough to buy one of those machines, so it's mostly for research purposes, right? So insertion talk, most people will agree that 35 Newton centimeters is kind of like the gold standard. Now, the question is, how low can we go? I would say that, in my experience I'm from the literature, some literature re report down to 10, 10 Newton centimeters, but they say if you, that happened, you put a provisional in there, you got to bond the teeth to the adjacent teeth, okay? That's too high risk for me. I would say my number, the threshold is around 20 Newton centimeters. Anything less than that, I probably will not put a provisional in there. I mean, and then what do I do under such circumstances? If I decide to leave the implant in there, now, when will I leave the implant in there if the implant is like 20 Newton centimeters? What I do is this. I put an implant mount on the implant and I take my hand. If I can twist it around, I know that it's less than 15. Okay? That means I'm not going to put a professional in there. And then the next thing I check is whether I keep the implant in there is I try to wobble it left and right or up and down. If the implant not only spin but wobble, implants are coming up. I'm not, I'm removing the implant. I either put a bigger implant if I can, mm -hmm. you know, I would never leave that implant in. Now, if the implant is still spinning, but no wobbling, there's a chance for it to still integrate. Mm -hmm. Okay, so anything less than 20, I probably won't put provisionally in there. So no lateral movement at all? No wobbling movement, right, no yes. wobbling. Yes. You try wobbling, if there's like mm -hmm. wobbling, no good. Hmm. Well, I think that this has been great conversation, really going through where are we now with, with this? Because this has been, I think, in some ways a bit confusing. You know, we, we, and, and the long-term stability, maybe the last thing I want to ask you about is long-term stability. Because like you say, data, this has to be data-driven. Mm -hmm. And you know, we, we see the contour that is you know, unchanged, uh, for, but for how long? And what do we currently know about these different techniques? Uh, and when does it become significant enough in the literature that you say, okay, I'm comfortable that this is at an equivalent technique? Okay, so immediacy, I think it is evidence-based right now. That means it is absolute a treatment option. We have more than 20 plus years of data, all right? That's more than enough. 
Rich Hill, 14 years at least under my hands, I would still say, I would say at this point, we can start slowly taking it away from the experimental stage. Mm. Mm. That means if we do it correctly, we should get good results. Contour grafting has been around for a long time, mm -hmm. okay? But the problem is a lot of data only show that one year follow up, okay? Uh, at least in my practice now, I have like more than 15, 16 years follow up. And tissue graft, you put the sashimi in there, over time, it will tend to thin out over time. It's normal, okay? The question is, it, but the beauty of it is, it slows down the inevitable. Last but not least, dual zone, we probably have close to around eight, nine years. Now, dual zone, I just want to point out is, dual zone can have complications too, although it's least sensitive. sensitive. Why? Because initially, if you look at Stephen Chu and Tanya's publication, they talk about using the xenograft. Mm -hmm. now, more recently, they change, right? They yes. say allograft, mm -hmm. and you know mm -hmm. why? Because uh, study have shown, uh, even in my case, you know, roughly around 11% of my cases, when I put xenograft in there, I have some almost like information. That's right. And then it won't go away. Yes. Yep. And I don't dare to, and, and a patient brush, you know, mm -hmm. it just won't go away. And I don't dare to go in there and just remove it because I may create a ditch. Yes. So, right. so now, but then the, if, when we do allograft, that let me solve our problem. When I do allograft, I still feel, see that several of my cases also have that issue. Mm -hmm. so it, so, yeah, so they've so talked about going toward yeah. less cortical bone, yes, right. smaller yes, particle right. sizes, mm -hmm. and all of those things matter. And so I think, like you say, we're still, the, the most modern version of that technique has maybe only been the last maybe three, four, five That's years right. where we have things to now, now we start counting forward on stability of that. So, well, this, I, I feel like we could talk about this all day. It's, yes. it's wonderful to hear your, your opinion on this and to not just opinion, but to see the data and to see the years of experience doing all the techniques and then be able to compare and contrast the uh, real world. That's, that's very powerful. Yeah, most recently, Dr. Joe Kahn has published on some of these um, high level techniques that we feel may be ready for prime time. And we're looking forward to hearing more about, well, what's the long-term evidence say? Mm -hmm. What's beyond one year? You know, I think you've even said it. At one year, we all look great. That's right. You know, mm -hmm. it's what we're looking at at 5, 10, and 15 years. And then how? what's the opportunity and when do we move to revision and how we revise our implant cases? Yes. Patients are outliving our prosthetics. Mm -hmm. And how do we modify prosthetics? We're yeah. learning about those things right here at the Academy of Osteointegration, right down to the nitty gritty of maybe the techniques we need to be using or at least exploring and finding people that can help take it to the next level. Yeah, well, thank you very much for being with us today. John, did we just rewrite Ponics versus Implants? I think we may have. I think after hearing, you know, when we, we think back to how our old way of thinking on connective tissue grafting from, from really the 70s, the 80s, what we learned mm. from the periodontic, periodontics literature on that technique and how time-tested that technique has been. And then the question is, when do you start changing? When does it become something that we don't need anymore? And how many things do we kind of combine together? Do we start combining techniques? You know, And I think, Wes, the biggest thing is the literature seems to show that the socket shield technique is a viable option. It has been proven. We now have enough data, I think, to show that that's the case. But I think this all comes back to managing complications and technique sensitivity. Because just because something is successful or can be done, it's like we were talking about at the beginning of the show, just because it can be done, the question is, can it be done by the masses? Is it ready really for prime time? Yeah. And I think you've really got to look at what it takes not to manage the complications only of socket shield, but what it takes to actually create the preparation that's necessary for this to be successful. Because as we were talking about before the show was, it comes down to like half a millimeter difference. What did you just say? Half a millimeter. Mm. I mean... That's serious, man. I mean, John, we're talking about class two preparations and crown prep margins, veneer preps that are less than a half a millimeter. I mean, how many oral surgeons, how many oral surgeons have been practicing doing veneer preparations and preparing How many teeth? of them even have a high-speed handpiece with the That's proper- Caden. 
the proper burr setup to where they could even do this in their practice. Not saying they don't have the ability to do it. Right. Do they have the tools and do they have the hand skills? It has nothing to do with how good they are at their job. This is a different hand skill that it's no different than if you don't do endo every day. That's right. It doesn't have anything to do with your knowledge or your capability, but if you're not doing endo every day and somebody throws you a difficult case and you're like, oh gosh, I've got to do this, you're, it's not going to maybe go very well mm -hmm. because you're just not used to that management of those hand skills. So I would go so far, Wes, as to say that it takes a special person here, not just the armamentarium, although that is a prerequisite, but it takes somebody with the hand skills to manage it. And I still think you've got to have the ability with the management of the complications to realize that revising these requires a certain skill set too. If you have a complication and you end up having to take a step back, yeah, I think you still have to have the knowledge and the skill set of how to perform a connective tissue graft yep. or something of the like in order to bail yourself out if you do have a failure of the socket shield. Well, that goes to say that if you do a procedure, you should know the most common complication and how to treat that complication. We know from even the most recent literature that Dr. Gluckman published, the most common complication, and, and according to Joe Kahn, is that the actual shield itself, the root remnant, now, if you're listening to this and you're thinking, man, what are they talking about? At this point, you're, you're still in it. You're still listening to us talk about this, which I think is great. Thank you for tuning yep. in. You're leaving root remnants here that has a PDL attached to it on the buckle plate to maintain bundle bone so that you maintain volume of hard and soft tissue in an aesthetic area. Yep. And so if that shield becomes exposed because of whatever reason, inadequate uh, room or space, um, the preparation wasn't right, or it becomes mobile or loose and therefore becomes infected, then there needs to be taught in the same manner how to treat the complication. And we know that the most common complication is this shield exposure, and we know the way to treat it is with a connective tissue graft. Now, the good news is, is that's a procedure that can be taught, and in most courses, uh, they are teaching that as a way to correct the issue. And I guess really for me, John, in my area of town where I'm practicing at, there's not many people that I know of that are doing um, even immediate implants, which is really sad. But number two, are they doing dual zone grafting with, you know, custom tissue formers to maintain volume? And then are they doing dual zone grafting with root shield mm -hmm. preparations to with dual zone and with custom tissue formers, which is the next level, next level. I just don't see a lot of it going around. And the reason why is because it's very difficult. Now, here's good news, John. I got good news for you. Our good friends at the Academy of Osteointegration have brought Dr. Khan in and he's teaching a course and we don't get paid to say this, but it's fantastic. Yep. He's teaching a course, and I'll flip over here on the browser. Let me turn that off. <laughs> go back to here. Sorry about that, guys, that are watching the video. But if you want to go to a course, well, on July 26th and 27th, uh, Dr. Khan himself is teaching a hands-on workshop. Um, the immediacy in the aesthetic zone, the perio-ortho-restorative connection, root shield preparation, Soft tissue graft harvest from the lateral palate. There's how you correct the exposures. Scarf connective tissue graft placement. How to actually do these grafts. I mean, look at the target audience. This mm -hmm. course is intended for graduate students. Okay, so that would be oral surgeons, periodontists, prosthodontist, any placer, mm -hmm. general dentist, and specialists along with the laboratory personnel so that you can learn how to do some of these custom tissue formers. I think it's amazing. I think it's a course that I would want to take, and um, it's very inexpensive. 
twenty one hundred bucks. Now that I think if you are hearing all of this, you know, and we've been talking about Socket Shield for a couple of years now, um, maybe three or four years now on the show, and we've had Dr. Gluckman on, and we've talked about all of this, and you know, we know that there are these, you know, giants in the field, you know, Hersler, uh, Gluckman, Zur, um, and of course Joe, uh, Joe Kahn. Some now, of these people sound we, like wizards off of like <laughs> i know right? it's lord like of the rings or some or kind something. of far off ut- yeah. dystopian but universe <laughs> if there's one thing that we've learned about this technique is that it is one of the times where a textbook doesn't do it justice no. uh photos don't do it justice <laughs> you truly have to go and learn from the masters mm. and and see it in person watch it and then decide after yeah. seeing it and doing it is this what you want to do in your practice? Is this something you feel comfortable enough with that it is ready for prime time for you? But kudos to the AO, not only mm. for a great meeting this year where we're able to get this content uh, created and, and, and interview such great people, but also for backing up their meetings and their journals with in-person education as being the next step and and that dr khan sees the the need for this so we want you to go check it out and of course we have to give a shout out one more time to the ao osteo.org go and check them out become a member it's one of the best memberships uh, in terms of rewards that you'll get uh, and the journals are just amazing as well if you haven't checked out our stuff in more depth if maybe you're just hearing about us through the ao or what it might be check out the dental guys we've got a lot more content over the last, gosh, almost 10 years now, Wes, which is crazy for you to check out. You're going to learn about a little bit about everything. So go like, share, subscribe to our channels. We're ready to provide a lot more in the coming year of all the things you want to hear about, both new and old in dentistry. So for Wes, I'm John. Thanks for tuning in to The Dental Guys.